The detonators attached to the explosive are connected to a complex firing device, which can fire every detonator simultaneously. When all the explosive is detonated simultaneously, the nuclear material is compressed into a supercritical mass, which results in a nuclear explosion. Most of the prompt gamma radiation is deposited between 25 and 30 kilometers altitude. The air molecules are ionized and the free electrons split off and start spiraling around the magnetic field lines. Each spiraling electron emits minute radio waves. All of the electrons exist nearly simultaneously and the minute radio waves add together. This is the primary source of the high altitude electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, which is a broadband pulse of radio frequency energy radiated from the deposition region. When this electromagnetic pulse is coupled into a system, very large voltages and currents may be induced. We will next consider a nuclear explosion of large yield at an altitude of 100 kilometers, where the atmosphere is less than one thousandth, as dense as it was at 50 kilometers. The initial heavily ionized X-ray fireball will be an order of magnitude larger than from our low altitude shot, and much more tenuous and less brilliant in appearance, because so much of the X radiation escapes to large distances over which it causes a significant ionization increase without luminosity. The atmosphere is so rarefied that the highly penetrating prompt gamma and neutron radiation from the explosion will produce only negligible concentrations of new ions in horizontal and upward directions. Ions are produced in the D layer and at lower altitudes. The hot and rapidly expanding fireball rises ballistically with something over five times the average velocity seen for the lower shot. Its diameter is some 300 kilometers after the first minute. Magnetic forces progressively distort the rising material, elongated along the geomagnetic field lines. Maximum altitude on the order of 1,000 kilometers is reached in seven or eight minutes. With the upward ballistic impulse exhausted, the material being heavier than the ambient atmosphere tends to fall back to denser regions on the order of 150 to 200 kilometers. The fall is oriented primarily along the Earth's geomagnetic field lines. The diameter is several hundred kilometers with a thickness perhaps a tenth as great. Actually, being electrically charged, the beta particles are constrained to follow the Earth's geomagnetic field lines. Thus, a region of ionization commonly called the beta patch is caused by these downward traveling electrons. The few beta particles that start out parallel to the field line will continue to follow them. If the particles encounter the field lines at an angle, however, they will spiral around them. Here we see beta particles streaming along the magnetic field through the fireball and debris of a burst. Those electrons ejected upward may be trapped along the Earth's magnetic field lines and are mirrored back and forth 
if the reversal or mirror point is substantially clear of the atmosphere. If the mirror points are too low, the electron will dip into the atmosphere at each end of its shuttle and soon will be lost by collision with air molecules. This collision excitation mechanism is generally accepted as one of the causes of auroral displays. Thus, a nuclear burst at sufficiently high altitudes can produce auroras at conjugate points in both hemispheres. Since the debris from a nuclear detonation begins radiating at the moment of the explosion, its conjugate point auroral effects can be expected to change location as the debris rises and intersects with successively higher magnetic field lines. Note that when the debris is located below about 200 kilometers, most of the electrons shuttling along the field lines will be lost in the atmosphere on their first pass, with very little mirroring back to the other conjugate point. We will next consider a nuclear explosion at altitudes above 250 kilometers. Mass asymmetries in the construction of the nuclear device and its carrier can be very important and are observable in this 400 kilometer explosion. At this very high altitude, a substantial change occurs in the mechanism of containment, the forces which slow and finally stop fireball and debris expansion. While ordinary hydrodynamic pressure resists the explosion expansion at low altitudes, geomagnetic back pressure becomes increasingly important at altitudes above 100 kilometers. The heavily ionized debris and gases in an expanding fireball are electrically conductive. So the Earth's magnetic field tends to be excluded from that region, creating a so-called magnetic bubble which presses back against the expanding gases. Yucca, orange, and teak were detonated at respectively 26, 43, 77 kilometers. On teak, chorioretinal burns were produced on all rabbits exposed, except on the surface ship at 300 miles, where clouds and ship roll may have prevented the rabbits from viewing the initial flash. On orange, cloud cover interfered with the surface station but burns were received in the aircraft at 225 miles. Yucca produced a bright fireball with a center core, which rapidly developed into a toroid similar to the teapot and plumbob altitude shop. The major part of the thermal pulse lasted about 30 milliseconds, with some perceptible signal for as long as 500 milliseconds. A double maximum was observed in the first part of the pulse, followed by a minimum at 2 milliseconds then a second maximum at about 13 milliseconds. The teak fireball expanded very rapidly for the first 100 microseconds, reaching a diameter of 10 miles in 10 milliseconds. The teak infrared fireball was almost 40 miles in diameter at H plus one second, after which it disappeared quickly. The orange fireball expanded more slowly, reaching a diameter of approximately 1.5 miles in 10 milliseconds. The orange infrared fireball, although of the same diameter, lasted somewhat longer than teak. Teak produced a single thermal peak at about 500 microseconds, decaying to less than 25% of the peak value in about 10 milliseconds. The corresponding times for a sea level burst would be two seconds to second maximum, and six seconds for the pulse to decay to 25% of peak radiance. The rapid expansion of the early fireball was spectacularly different from a sea level shot. The lower orange shot showed a transition situation with a the thermal pulse indicating some of the characteristics of a lower altitude shot intermediate between teak and surface bursts. Johnston Island had a slant range of 252,000 feet from shot teak. The overpressure measured approximately 0.1 pounds per square inch. The same station at a slant range of 196,000 feet from shot orange measured 0.18 pounds per square inch.